So Jane and I have taken the completely opposite approach to preparing for today, because I'm talked out. I feel I have spent two years writing everything I can think of and then chewing over my own words and turning every sentence into a sentence that was two words shorter and then turning it all upside down and then going around the place and talking to people who ask me always interesting and different questions, but they always start with, you know, why did you want to write this book? It's like, I kind of say that in the introduction, but anyway, fine, let's do that again. <laughs> so what I, what I want to do is I just want to tell you a few things that I've learned since writing it, really, because this is my first book and I'm a Jane come lately here. I mean, Jane has been doing this for eight years and Julie has been doing it for 17 years and counting. Oh, you don't look old enough. <laughs> So, so for me, this was kind of like three years ago, I didn't know this was happening. Um, I don't know, maybe Maya feels the same. Yeah, so Maya and I are the kind of like the newbies here. And um, so for me, the things that I learned from writing it and from the experience afterwards has been a mixture of uh, really quite depressing and actually very energising. So I thought, I thought the depressing things were going to be, you know, being lied about, being defamed, etc., etc. Actually, I don't give a fuck. <laughs> and the reason I say that is because many of you are in the same situation that you want to say things. And I'm not telling you to speak out if you know you're going to lose your job for speaking out. I'm not saying that at all. And I'm certainly not saying have an argument with your woke daughter. Don't do that. Don't have a family falling out. It's not worth it. But you know what? If what's stopping you from talking out is that it's embarrassing or you feel bad, I've never felt so good in my life. It's <laughs> lovely. It's lovely being on the far side. So on the other side of it, I was worried that, you know, people would dislike me. I repeat the sentence that I've already said, etc., etc. So it's actually very nice. So once you say it, you start to feel better. And you will also have the strange experience that actually a lot of the tigers are paper tigers. So the experiences that I've had, you know, when people are so sure that they're right and that you're wrong and that you're a bigot and so on, and you say, what about the rapists and they're putting in the women's jails? And they go, because they didn't think about that. They just thought, oh, trans women are women, it's fine, you know? And so then you realise that actually people haven't thought through what they're thinking about and you start to feel better and, you know, you can rehearse your arguments. And I wrote the book to help you to do that. That was precisely why I wrote it. And actually, you start to feel a lot better. And you start to feel a lot better with yourself as well. I didn't feel good for about a year. And the reason I didn't feel good was I didn't feel right in, in myself and in the world. Like, I felt that I was, you know, I was, I'd gone out into... Well, I don't know what I can call it. Like, I do think this puts us all in the upside down, this thing. Like, back, you know, black is white, up is down, everything like that. But that's not what I felt like. I felt like I was on thin ice. And I didn't like that feeling that I didn't know what was going on and I wasn't sure I was right. I thought maybe I'd got something wrong. There was something I was missing. It really bothered me. I lost sleep over it. And once I got through that and got to the place that I felt I had thought it all through to my own satisfaction, I felt much better. And then when I started talking about it, I felt much better as well. So that was the first thing that I learned from doing it. It's not as scary as it feels beforehand. Again, I don't want you to get sacked. Don't do that. Um, the second thing that I learned, and this is one of the depressing ones, is, holy God, what are we doing wrong with the teaching of logic? I just can't get over it, you know? I mean, some of the things that we're saying, like, I can't believe that people can't understand it when I say, if you allow male people into female spaces, they're no longer female only. That isn't even a logical proposition. <laughs> That is just me saying the same thing twice. <laughs> and yet people can't get it. And people can read the entire book, at least I assume that people who reviewed the book read it all. I do wonder about some of them, particularly the one who said it would have been nice if she thought about the trade-offs. I'm like, did you read the last chapter? It's about that. Anyway, so it is quite depressing to discover that there are large numbers of people who cannot see what you're saying when you say, if you allow male people into female spaces, they are no longer female only. That was depressing. Another thing that was very depressing was the extraordinary willingness to lie. And I mean, I don't mean to misrepresent, I just mean to lie. Um, I lived in a fool's paradise five years ago. Julie has been living outside the fool's paradise for 17 years and counting, but I haven't. I was in the fool's paradise still. I thought, you know, governments, 
and organisations were generally all right. They were generally well-meaning. Most people, if you told them something, like, you know, if they said something and you said, well, you know, that doesn't quite work because if you do that, you're not going to be able to keep men out of rape crisis centres. They go, oh, didn't think of that. You're right. I genuinely thought that. You know, I thought that you could say to people, you know, if you define sexual orientation as being about how people feel, then you're not actually going to be able to have same-sex attracted as a thing. And I thought they'd get it. And, I, and now I have completely realised what an idiot I was and how ignorant I was about human psychology. Another thing that was very depressing to me was just the frank misogyny. I didn't know that. You know, I haven't worked in a rape crisis centre, I haven't worked in domestic violence, I haven't worked you know, with women who've been in prison or any of those things. I was just doing an ordinary everyday job. I was editing the finance section and things like that. I didn't know how much people really, really dislike and hate and think little of women and that I include a lot of women in that so I mean I was a bit stunned to read a review by a young woman who said that my tone was harsh and unfortunate (laughs) (laughs) you haven't heard me do harsh you really haven't if you think my book was harsh but also did you not know young woman that that's what women have been had said for them forever Mm -hmm. but that's what they say they say you know if only you'd said it more nicely. I would have listened to her if she'd said it more nicely. Oh, it was the, you know, I just I couldn't listen. That was so mean. It was so nasty. Seriously. Do you not think this is going to be turned on you? I, I didn't know that. I was honestly living in a fool's paradise. That's depressing. Um, and then the, sort of the last depressing bit, and I, I don't know where I stand on this. So I'm still the eternal optimist, 19th century, classical liberal. I believe, I do believe that the only way we can get anywhere is you know, rational debate, free speech, back to all of those values, like I say in the book. And now I'm afraid that that's gone. And some of the people I admire a lot, like Mary Harrington, I'd say, for example, she says, we're in the post-liberal world. She wrote a fantastic, I think it was a joint review of me and Kathleen, and she said in it um, that both of us, you know, had written these kind of rational books where we explain, like, what's wrong with these ideas? But the thing is, the ideas are so stupid, as Kathleen says, you know, it doesn't take more than 90 seconds to say what's wrong with them. So, so how come you having to do this? So, you know, well, there's something else going on here. You're not in the liberal world. You're not in the world where people say, oh, right, I see what you mean. It can't be female only then, can it? Huh, right, need to think again. So, so we're in a different world, and Mary says it's the post-liberal world. And in that world people like Kathleen and me are bringing the knife to the gunfight or actually turning up with some flowers to the nuclear standoff, you know? (laughs) I don't know what to do about that. And I think about that all the time because, well, for two reasons. One is for personal reasons, I'm absolutely committed to saying things clearly and logically, listening to what other people say, trying to give reasons, using proper logic and all of that thing. But the other reason is I don't think humanity can get anywhere without that. I mean, that is the way that we make knowledge. There is only one way to make knowledge. There are not other ways of knowing and all that sort of thing. There's one way to do it, which is the testing ideas, the viewpoint diversity, the listening, the knocking things down, the coming back and trying again, you know, the asking people to test your ideas stuff. If we're not in that world anymore, I don't know what to do next. So, I mean, that's kind of a bit existential and large, but that's where I'm at in my head at the moment. The... Some of the positive things that can, have come out of all of this is I feel I, I'm not willing to give up on the, the liberal sort of structure because I feel that one of the things that we're doing now is we are forcing people to start to debate. Mm-hmm. It is very different, as anyone who's been in this knows, even just the last few years. It, the no debate thing has stopped. Mm-hmm. Um, there are people who still try to say it. Um, you know, I haven't actually gone on the BBC God forbid. But I mean, they have rung me and invited me on and then cancelled. <laughs> so that's something. And in the little conversation in there, I did say, look, I know you think that you want to have a debate, but you know, nobody's going to come on with me. So why not empty chair them? And they're like, oh, yeah, I see what you mean. Yeah, OK, right. So, you know, that's, that's not where I was three years ago. So that's something. Um, and once you start to debate, it's much, much better because what we say is actually quite useless compared to what they say. I mean, it is so much more useful to have Ed Davey go, no, there should be nowhere. No, no, not rape crisis centres, not sports. Of course, women can't keep uh, male people out. That's much better than us saying, why is everyone saying that you can't keep male people out? Because then people say we're lying or exaggerating. But they're doing it. They're doing it in front of us. So the more we can make them do it, the better. 
And that's why I think we need to start asking these questions. You need to ask your MP. You need to, you know, phone into radio shows. You need to ask people at organisations locally. And the bit where they say, oh, but trans women are women, stop and say, but, you know, you do, you do know trans women are male, don't you? Because most people will actually say yes to that. The, the ideologues don't, but most people will. And then you can say, so you are saying that we can't keep males out of female spaces. Um, and then they're a bit confounded. And if they're willing to say, yes, I absolutely cannot keep male people out of female spaces, you've won, actually, because they've said it. They've, they've done the quiet part out loud. And then the other thing is that humour is incredibly helpful in this. I mean, I haven't actually felt down particularly in any of this. I'm a bit exhausted, but I'm not down. I mean, because it's very interesting. It is actually extremely funny. <laughs> I mean, I know that doesn't sound like the right word to use because terrible things are happening. And I, I don't mean, I'm, I'm certainly not mocking terrible things happening. I'm saying that it's actually very funny when a man says he's a woman. It's just a funny thing to do, you know? <laughs> it sounds like I'm very mean. I'm harsh and unfortunate. Sorry about that. Um, I don't mean I want to laugh at individuals. I don't. I think there are people who are very unhappy. And I can accommodate people, individuals who are unhappy. It's the idea of ripping up something that's true about all of us and, like, irreducibly true. Like, we're embodied mammals, you know? It's such a bizarre thing to think about that once you remember that, it makes me laugh over and over again that anyone can pretend we don't come in two flavours. It's just so bizarre. <laughs> um, and then the other thing that's funny is when you actually see, you know, the sports thing. That's hysterical. Like, it's not funny for the people who are competing, but it's actually just very funny on the page. I, I, I've said this before, but, you know, I've shown photos of, you know, Laurel Hubbard or whoever standing on the podium with women on either side, and nobody I've shown it to in my, ever has not laughed. Because you have to laugh. It's like, this is just delusional, you know? Anyone going along with this is just going along with something very delusional. Um, and that is kind of the end of what I wanted to say, and there's two possibilities here I'm going to ask the organisers. Someone who's talked out, someone who can talk very fluently when she's told what to talk about, but has kind of run out of steam. Um, shall I ask people what they want me to talk about, or would you prefer to save the time and move on? <laughs> to move on to questions at the end. Fine by me. Somebody's got to make a decision today. Yeah, thank you very much. <laughs>